Well, hello, 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 and welcome once again to 25 O'Clock. I'm your host, Dan Drago. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me on the show. Here we are, Philadelphia's longest-running music podcast, I think. Great, great guest this week. I got to talk to Derek Anthony Wilson. He fronts the group Arch Palantine, just a powerhouse R&B soul group. I featured them back on episode 228. That was my first introduction to Derek and to Arch Palantine. Outstanding song. You should go back and listen to episode 228. That's one of my many playlist episodes. Tons of great music on that one. But like I said, that was my first introduction to Derek and the band Arch Palantine. We had a great conversation, uh, outstanding dude, outstanding musician, killer singer. Uh, you'll, you'll hear it. We, we get into it. We do it all. You, you, you know the drill at, at, at this point. As always, uh, we'll get to Derek in just a moment. But of course, if you're new to the show, old to the show, medium to the show, I highly recommend you check out 25oclockpod.com. That's our website. That's our place, our home on the internet. So you can do everything there. You can get all the episodes. They're all available for streaming and for downloading. You can sign up for the mailing list. I send out an email every time there's a new episode, let you know what's going on, who's on the show. Uh, a small amount of my musings, but you know, I, I, I try and keep it all business. Uh, you can hook up with me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Am I getting rid of the Facebook? Am I not getting rid of the Facebook? I haven't talked about it in a while. I'm going to tell you this. On my phone, you know how you can save tabs on your phone, on your net browser? I have a little article open that I'm going to delve more into at some point that's simply called How to Delete Your Facebook Account. It's sitting there. It's like a nuclear option. It's like this little thing I have saved that like, I always know in the back of my head when it just when it just goes too far, I can just read that article and just pull the rip cord, hit the, hit the ejector seat button and just be out, be out of the Facebook world. Anyway, I'm sure you're all really, really looking forward to me talking more about whether or not I'm going to delete or not delete, uh, my Facebook account. Anyway, back to the website. Uh, you can also check out the friends and neighbors page. That's where you find out more information about everyone who's been on the show. I put up links for that. So if you're listening to an artist, you like what you hear, you want more information, you want to support them, you just go to the Friends and Neighbors page, click away, click away on your favorite Philadelphia artists. You do all that at 25oclockpod.com. Do it. So anyway, Derek Anthony Wilson fronts the band Arch Palantine. You can check out their music, archpalantine.com, A-R-C-H-P-A-L-A-N-T-I-N-E, Archpalantine. We talk a little bit about the the origins of the name and how it, it had to be changed. Uh, that's, always, that's always a good time for an artist when you have a name and you think that you're just going to operate under it. And it turns out that then you uh, you have to change it. We talk about that. They got a new single out right now. It's called Hypnotized. Like I said, I played it back on episode 228. Uh, the new full-length record is done. I've heard it, and it's coming out later this year. They've got a new single coming out later in the month. Some shows coming up April 20th, 420, baby, at World Cafe Live. Arch Palantine will be playing with uh, Dead Friends and the Philly Folk Review. Dead Friends being, of course, uh, Mike Corrado's outstanding Grateful Dead tribute band. So uh, you don't want to miss that. April 20th at World Cafe Live. Uh, they also have a show coming up June 17th at Dawson Street Pub up in Maniunk. Get all that information at archpalantine.com. So let's just do it. Let's just get into it. My conversation with Derek Anthony Wilson of Arch Palantine here on 25 o'clock. <laughs> You're from you're from here originally, right? You're you're from Philly. You're born born and raised, as the cliche goes. And funny enough, yes, I am, and from West Philly at that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and my sisters went to middle school with the Smith family. So oh, okay. I'm so you're like right, kind of out there, like towards Overbrook and all that, because I know that's that's where he was originally from. Exactly. I lived in Overbrook until actually last year. Oh, okay. <laughs> how 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 far did you go? <laughs> <laughs> I just moved up the road a little bit. I'm on the main line now in Haverford. Oh, okay, yep. 
I know it well. I used to teach out there, so I know the drive well. I know seven different ways back from uh, from Haverford and Ardmore back into back into the city that don't involve uh, seventy six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I do too. All of them terrible, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so you grew so you grew up in 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 West Philly. What was the 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 early music life for you? I know you were you were in like choirs and you were singing like like when you were young like what was the thing that clicked for you i remember one time in second grade well i stole my sister's mariah carey cassette tape for vision of love and i was a boy soprano and i and she had it in her room and i was i had my little cassette player and i had it on and i like put her i tried every one of her tapes to see what i liked and i tried vision of love and that was the last time she saw that cassette (laughs) <laughs> and looking back now, I think I realized how much I loved to sing and music. It was right when Whitney Houston did the high note for the national anthem. And all I went to all boys school, Chestnut Hill Academy, and all the boys had to audition to sing the oh, the land of the free. And another boy got the part and I cried and I knew then. That it was in you. That was it. <laughs> like yeah. that made me cry. Yeah, yeah. That's funny too. I right, so I I think you and I are about the same age then because like I that like I was a child in the eighties and a teenager in the nineties. So um like Whitney, Mariah, like all because that was just on the radio in, in the late eighties. You couldn't you couldn't escape it. It was just everywhere you turned, it was like, yeah, Whitney or Mariah were like the two huge ones on on, on the radio at the time. That was who I grew up listening to, too. And I was in the boys choir at Chestnut Hill Academy. I was in my church's choir, which was all of us little kids just singing um, in unison. (laughs) And uh, I started writing songs probably in fourth or fifth grade because I was taking piano lessons then. And I remember pulling my aunt aside and saying, hey, listen to the song I wrote. And it was some ridiculous little simple thing, but she gave me all the love she could. Like, that was amazing. You know how family members do. Yeah, it's it's impressive at that age to even like finish a whole thing. Because when, you know, when when you're that age, you're like 10 and you don't finish anything. (laughs) (laughs) Because I've I've taught kids before, too, at at all at all ages from as as young as nine or 10 all the way up to teenagers. And it's like the nine or 10 year olds, you can like see like like everyone in like a few dozen that you teach you catch a couple that you're just like okay this is your this is for you like and i imagine you were one you were one of those kids where you could just look at look at you and just be like this is gonna be for you like for for the rest of your life (laughs) (laughs) i had a music teacher who saw that too and she asked me to tell my mom and dad that she wanted to be my manager (laughs) 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 and they were like yeah whatever you know they paid it no mind. Well, nowadays, nowadays you would would have helped to have that manager, you know. <laughs> yes, Doctor Chernohorsky, where are you? Yeah, yeah, you missed missed the boat. <laughs> Dozen dozens of dollars uh, available to you. <laughs> 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 That's cool. So, like, just as as a kid, you're you're singing. In the school, out of the school, you play piano, obviously, and that's always super helpful. Uh, even if you're going to be like primarily a vocalist for you know the the rest of time, like piano is incredibly helpful uh Mm -hmm. just being able to figure stuff out and do arrangements and then you're writing songs too what was it like when you're like when do you think you started writing songs in a way not just the way kids write songs as something to do but when you started writing songs being like oh i think i might actually again like i might be on to something here uh in sixth grade i remember we had a creative writing project every kid was writing like these were these fantastic stories about Sonic the Hedgehog or Mario or <laughs> these wild adventures. And I remember I wrote a song in my English book journal and I was so happy about it. And the teacher was like, well, that's not really a creative writing project, but Boo. that's what came out. So I never saw that again. I never saw that notebook again. I'm like, where's my song? They took it. And they 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 cashed it in, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it's 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 so weird at, at at that age when you kind of run into these like weird, you run into the wall of the rules where people are like, "Well, mm. this isn't what I asked you to do," and you're just like, mm. "I did something." You should be <laughs> impressed. I did something, especially in six, again sixth grade. Like you're just like, I, "I I completed the assignment. I win." 
(laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Um, It was such a good class, too. We had, I think we were really unruly at that point, and just anything went. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's a all boys school, and you guys are all in sixth grade. I would imagine is quite quite unruly. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Not th- not that it, in in all, but, but all boys or co-ed schools or whatever. At that age, everything is is un- unruly. Half of us are like eight feet tall, and the other half are still like four feet tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get this weird. Yeah, th- it never will there be like a larger disparity between like you and your peers and all that. Um, Thank God you guys weren't around girls because, like, they get super tall at that age, too, some of them, and it just scares the hell out of you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not you're you're romantically attracted to, to women or not, like, just women get very, like, girls get lar- get tall at that age. You're just like, oh, my God. You realize it's like, oh, I think they can kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We had one girl in our neighborhood who, like, used to actually beat us up pretty bad. We tried to get her back a couple times, but... She, I remember she actually was brutal and there was this next door neighbor I had. He was like, you're not going to help me out. And I'm like, I don't know. She's like Godzilla. Like, yeah, you're on your own, man. I don't know what you did, but, uh, you know, maybe you should leave town. (laughs) So, so, so you're in school, you're doing all the music things in school. Were you like in musicals and things like that? Yes. We did a musical every year, one a year. And in third grade, we did Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Then we did HMS Pinafore, Oliver, Damn Yankees, Godspell. And I forget what else we did. Rumpelstiltskin, maybe? And we kept doing them. And in in third grade, I got a part, which was really hilarious. And I don't know if it should have gone down this way, but it did. (laughs) I had to play Potiphar's wife in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. As a third grader dressed in drag yep. to seduce Joseph, who was an eighth grader. There's a lot of things going on right there. A lot of things to unpack right there, just in that in that one little thing right there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess all boys school, you know, you, you can't just like pick musical. There aren't too many musicals that are just like all men. I guess Damn Yankees is pretty close. Damn and Yankees. then someone still has someone still has to be Lola. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And HMS Pinafore again, mostly dudes except for oh, who I, I don't even know who Nan who, and who, Vet or I forget the I, I I don't remember I don't remember my 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 Pinafore at all other than like a couple of the songs. Um, were, you yeah. in, were you in musicals too? Yeah, yeah, I did some. I did My Fair Lady. I did oh. uh, I did Anything Goes, uh, which cemented my love for for Cole Porter for the rest of my life. Right oh, there, nice. like I, I I dug into him. Uh, and we did uh, How to Succeed in Business uh, when I was in high school as well. Um, all very fun. I was mostly either a, either a cast extra or chorus. I did a lot of tech too. Like I just, I don't know, it was fun. It was something to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was in, I was in bands and all that. Like it was all just uh, the the musicals were mostly uh, mostly because that to to meet girls. Um, hey. But then it turned out that I, but then it turned out that I liked it. So uh, so that was that was useful. So in the end, also I didn't play sports. I wasn't a, I was a very tall kid, but I didn't. You know, I, I wasn't athletically inclined. People were always just like, play basketball. And I was like, but I don't want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're like, you're tall. You ever said people come to you like, you're tall. You should play basketball. I go, yes, but that all you have to ha- have two things to play basketball. You have to be tall and you have to want to play basketball. And if you don't have one of those things, then or both of those things, then I don't think it's going to work out for you <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a basketball player. Dan, how tall are you? I'm six one. Oh, OK. Um, but I mean, again, at, at the time when you're like six in sixth grade and like I started creeping up in that direction pretty early, uh, skinny as hell, um, awkward as hell, terrified of everything and my own shadow, um, you know, just just real, <laughs> just just an absolute prototypical sixth grader. Uh, that was me. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And thank God for music. Right. Because like when you cotton on to that stuff at that age, like a lot of times it's what not to be, it's what saves your life. Uh, I mean, who knows how it could go for you at that age. There's so much going on just in, in your brain and in your body and like around you that like, if you have music or theater or choir or something to like to latch onto, like that can be like the thing that mm-hmm. like keeps you centered. At least, at least was for me. I don't know if it was for you. I, I imagine so. Oh, it totally was. I was into different music than my classmates. Like they were, they had like a nine inch nails band, a rage against the machine band, Nirvana band. And they all 
hung out in like the same classroom and I was in there too, but I was more into like boys to men and R and B, but they were all my friends. So we just all hung out in the same room acting like we were superstars all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's funny too. Cause, cause back then the, uh, the, like, like genres like didn't touch, like you couldn't be into both. Like, I would have been what I I would have been the kid into Nine Inch Nails, nice. uh, and at the time, like even if you liked a Boys to Men song on, on the radio, and I did, like you couldn't be telling people <laughs> that you liked a Boys <laughs> to Men song on the radio. And the other way around, like if you were hanging around with a bunch of R and B kids, like you couldn't like necessarily tell them that like you dig this Nirvana record. Oh no, know. yeah, no, oh no, we went through this whole thing with Green Day. <laughs> <laughs> I secretly loved Green Day, but I had to keep it a secret. I remember that I was like. Oh, I love this album, Dookie. I can't tell nobody. I can't tell nobody. You could probably you you, you could tell the kids at school with 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 the with the Rage Against the Machine band. Like they they'd probably be down. Yeah. But like yeah yeah. I imagine you like couldn't go down the block and be and like like play the Green Day record on on the block. Like I don't know if they would they would just look at you and just be like the hell is this? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> And now none of that means anything. Now it's now you listen to whatever the hell you want wherever, and and we just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're kind of getting through high school, obviously you knew in your head you probably wanted to go to school for music. You you ended up doing that, correct? I actually didn't. Um, I was not strong enough to stand up to my dad. And on the way up, so I went to Lehigh University. And on the way up, I remember going to. I was 17, and I'm driving up 611 to go to my college interview. And mom and dad are in the car with me. And I'm like, yeah, I think I want to do music. And my dad pulls over to the side of the highway, gets out of the driver's seat and was like, if you want to get to your interview, you're going to have to drive the west, rest of the way. And you can't go to that school and do music. And I was like, what? And, you know, inside I was crushed, but I was like, I'm a man up. I'm going to do it then, you know, like I'm getting to this school. <laughs> but I didn't know to say, no, dad, like you should know that that is 100 percent me that yeah. I need to go there and do that. Well, I mean, I, I you know, you, you understand it, too, because like it doesn't I don't know what you came from, but at least from in my situation, coming from something a, a little more working class, like that's not something that you go and do. And if you mm -hmm. go to college, you go to college to have to get a career, you know, to have something where you're going to be safe and be able to take care of yourself and do better you know, your parents always want you to do better than than they did. Yes, uh, so you, yes. I, I, and I imagine you realize you, at that moment your father was just like, "Well, no, you can't do music because, like, what what's he going to do? Like, what? It just doesn't compute." Where it's just like, "That's not a career. That's like that's something famous people do on TV." As if mm -hmm. you know those people don't have careers. But <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what he was thinking because he would only come to my sporting events. So I was like the captain of the track team, and he came to all my track meets. But when I was uh singing a solo in a arranger an arrangement or on a in a choir or something he wasn't there he was he came i think he came to like one concert in five years four or five years uh of, of course at, towards the end of everything i've forgiven him and we talked about it and we've you know smoothed everything out but at that time i was just like where's my dad what do you think that was you just he wasn't it was he a music guy like did he did he like music did he like listening to music and all that like he did he loved the bands from the he went to woodstock he was like big into music he loved Jimi hendrix and i don't i think he just wanted me to be like the most masculine version of myself and that wasn't who i was i was more artistic and doing art and drawing and painting and fashion music being with my mom all the time and that's not and that wasn't his first and only born son oh okay yeah so he he in his head he had a lot riding on you that had nothing to do with you and everything to do with him <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that's interesting um but you said like later you guys worked out does he come and see you play now like like when you go play well he passed away in 2019 oh i'm sorry oh, okay i'm sorry to hear that i'm glad he missed covid that would have been oh yeah, a yeah. Mess. oh i i've I've thought of a few people in my life who who passed shortly before that, and I'm just like, oh god, I'm glad they didn't have to see this. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, who, who, who knows how that would have gone down? Yeah, he became my best friend in the last three or four years of of his life. He was my best friend, so oh, that was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We smoothed everything out. It was good. And you were, but back at that time too, you were making music. Like you, you had records. Uh, the one, uh, one of the older ones I listened to. 
uh came out in 2018 mm -hmm. so like you were you were doing your thing at, at that point right oh yeah yeah I, the tide turned probably in 2003 or four and i was in a group in philly while at lehigh called contemporary voices for christ and it was my voice teacher who had written all these songs and she hired a group of her favorite singers to do the songs in concert form. And we did a couple shows at different churches around town. And we also did a big concert at the Clef Club. And that day my aunts came and my dad came and he was, he finally like saw another side of me that he didn't understand before. Yeah. And I think that's when the table started turning. I got such great feedback from that concert that it fed my spirit to keep going. And it's just a good, it was like a good turning point. Well, that's good. It's, it's, cause it's always tough when like, I mean, with, with, I mean, parents, just relationships with parents of, of all people and all kinds, whatever. It's just always rough. Cause like they have expectations for you and they have things that they want you to be, which like I said, is, is all them and has nothing to do with you, but you still have to, you still have to live in that world. Yeah. So it's, it's cool that like, as you started stepping out and doing things and your father started to come see it and he was like, Oh, well, this is what you've been on about all these years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And my mom was like, see, told you, Kenny. Told you you could sing. <laughs> <laughs> so so you went to Lehigh. What did you end up going to, to, to college for then? Um, I started as mechanical engineering. That's what my dad does. It's <laughs> 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 so funny. Yeah. And then after doing that for a year and a half, I switched to marketing and public relations. It's almost like music. After engineering, marketing and public relations can kind of be like 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 the arts. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is the arts after that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's 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 a certain kind of person, a certain kind of mind who can dial in to like to to engineering, particularly like mechanical stuff. My my father would my my father's still a still a mechanical engineer. Um and it's a certain certain analytical mind that can just look at a machine and be like, okay. I know exactly how this works and what every single part does and how they should be constructed and all that. And it's just, I, I certainly didn't get that from, from him. There's no, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Um, but where did you, did, did you end up going to grad school? Like, cause obviously you've trained like the, 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 the way you sing, unless that's all like just in private, you know, private training and private lessons and things like that. All private training, all private training and lessons. Um, I would have done vocal performance on like, honestly, or maybe composition, but I did vocal lessons with what well, was in all of these choirs. So I feel like that is vocal training in some way. I was in the university choir. We went on tour every other year. And then I was trained by Leah Hopkins, Daniel Terrazas, Jim Long. I know the Leah Hopkins name. I don't know why, but I... Oh, she was a she's a teacher at Settlement Music School. She was my vocal teacher for a long time. I remember first lesson. She was my first vocal coach. And in the first lesson, she's like, Dirk, welcome to, you know, welcome to my studio. When you're finished here, you're going to sound like this. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to sound like that. But, <laughs> <here we are. laughs> But she, I, at that point, I was barely a tenor. Like I could sing an F, but it was a struggle. And then after singing with her, it was like smooth sailing. She taught me how to pass through my passaggio and go up into my upper register pretty easily. And uh, I loved it. I loved singing and I, and I just loved being around her and her family are all musicians. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool when you get a good teacher like that. You just kind of get like adopted a little bit like not just as a student but just like as a as a person as well that's always nice i had good teachers uh when i was in school as well choir and things like that where did you go to um, school uh in uh western new york oh okay whoa okay wow i had a great uh i had a great choir director uh in in high school uh, yes. a uh excellent urbane gay black man named lonnie arnold uh Love who it. was Love just it. And he would look, he was just like, like manners down to nothing. And he would just look at you with that like mannered look when you were, when you were screwing around and he would just be like, hmm, and he would say, hmm, and you would just be like, oh shit, I better, I better straighten up. <laughs> but he was a great nothing teacher. Like he, he, yeah, he was a great teacher really was. And like really challenged us, like really like put material in front of us that like probably most high school kids didn't 
didn't do because he was just like he was like i want to i want to hear music that's interesting to me was always his thing so he's like so i'm gonna make you all sing it <laughs> like, yeah but i learned and when i was in rock bands and all that like all the stuff he taught me was super helpful if you want to if you're playing a live show and you want to push like it, and you got to make it happen like you even wh whether it's happening or not like you got to mm, make it happen yes speak speak dan yes but but you learn that stuff in like traditional vocal uh you know vocal instruction like you 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 learn that and i think that's something that kind of gets people don't people don't think about that like but like if you can sing if, if you can sing an aria then like you can there's some stuff you can do now that like doesn't necessarily apply to arias that is so true i had to emulate that i mean conjure that up on the show at the uh hypnotized single release show because i came into the club and i was like man my voice isn't doing that good today like what's going on with me and so some of the songs you know are really high up there and trans and like you have to go through i have to go through my breaker i'm like my voice is not hitting it so i'm like let me sing in my house which is uh <laughs> <laughs> like the the term when you're in your column of air yeah, I had to sing. I had to like really push into like a mixto when normally it would be like full voice and 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 try to use all these techniques that you learn over time. Oh, yeah, I've I've, I've been up, to, you know, you get up there singing, you don't think about it when you're doing it, but like moving between like chest voice and head voice and like moving kind of in between my full voice and my falsetto in ways, but like just being able to like kind of dance back and forth on that line and having it still sound good. Mm -hmm. Like that's always, that's always tricky. Um, but again, like when I've been able to do that in live situations or in studio situations, I always think to myself, I'm like, God bless Lonnie Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna throw my uh, high school director out there too. Mr. Roland Ware. Love of my, one of the loves of my life. I gotta say, he's amazing. You gotta love those 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 people back then, because like I don't know, he expected things of us. Like he expected things of us, like we were professionals. He expected things of us, like we were adults. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that age, not everybody does that of you. Like people still kind of treat you like a kid or like a joke. Um, so it's and I say same thing with like my theater directors and stuff like that back in high school. Like I had a couple of people in my life in you know in school who just like looked at us and were just like. No, I'm going to treat you like I'd treat any any group of pros, like any group of musicians, of actors, or whatever. It's like you're going to do this to my standard, uh, and if you can't, then you'll you'll learn. Um, That's right. Which is joyous. And so when I would teach when I would teach kids too, like at a certain level, I would be like, okay, well, here's the level I think you should be playing at, and I and and I'm going to get you there. Like is 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 how it is. I don't know if you've you've taught as well. I know a lot of musicians end up teaching at some point or another. So <laughs> <laughs> definitely, yeah, yeah. I once I'm had a Girl Scout troop who I had to teach carols to, so we could go around the nursing homes, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fun. It's 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 fun to do that, and it's fun to watch people get it. It's fun to watch people like the light to go on, and people be like, "Oh, I'm having a good time." I'm like, "Yeah, you can just have a good time." Like, you don't even have to be that great at it. You just have to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. This is something I did want to ask. I, I asked this of, of a lot of people who, like, study, you know, study music in, in, in university or conservatory. But I think it would apply to you as well. What's something that you remember from your instruction that, like, you will take with you to your, to, to your grave? Um, in a choir setting, I have one thing is do not wipe your face on stage <laughs> while you're in the choir because your best friend who's in the audience will call you out on it every time <laughs> and i remember i was sweating and sweat is going in my eyes and i'm like if i wipe this one little bit of sweat i know he's going to say seat. something <laughs> <laughs> and i wiped my sweat and you know good thing he came right up to me after the show Derek, you shouldn't have wiped your sweat. I saw you. Your head went from shiny to dull. It was a big change <laughs> on the whole stage. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. When did the Arch Palatine project start there? Well, from what I understood, it was originally just called Palatine, and then there was some, some, uh, some legal issues. <laughs> and a brilliant friend of mine, we were talking. We were all at the grape room, and we're like, oh, I need to come up with a new name. You know, I'm not going to go into court and fight these degenerates. Like, I'm just going to do what I need to do. And one of my friends said, why don't you just become the Arch Palatine? <laughs> I'm like, oh, give it to him and get an original name. That's right. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. It's always interesting, too, in those situations, because like you, you'll look because that is a that's an element, though. And like you've kind of 
hung your project on a name up to a certain point, and we're pretty sure that no one else was called that. And then you look, and then you look up, and you're just like, well, technically, these people have a leg to stand on. Right, right. We're both from southeastern. But I think Arch Palatine is uh, is is pretty badass. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, I see them troll my new projects. Like I'll go on a YouTube video and be like, "Oh, that's that guy from that old Palatine band." Oh my goodness, still are they still him? a band? I don't. They probably are. They allegedly were a band since the '90s. Yeah, and they were playing some shows. And the way I found out is a coworker at, saw Palatine on a marquee in a bill, and I was like, "I'm not playing that. Who is that?" And so I had to investigate. That's a good way to. It's a, that's a way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when did the uh, when 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 did the project start? Like for you, like was it just like sort of a solo thing for you, or did you have people around you and you're like forming an actual group out of it? Arch Palatine um, broke ground in 2019 in January of 2019 when we released that year. We decided to release the Amalgam album, and it's been a struggle saying if it's a solo project or a band because a lot of my bandmates at different times were not very active in the band. And so I would get non-responses and I would say, oh, let's do the show, crickets. Oh, let's do this, crickets. And I was like, well, I can't not do the show. I'm going to do the show. So I'm going to have to double as Arch Valentine and Derek Anthony Wilson. And if the band starts rocking, then I will fall back and let the band stay Arch Valentine and then just stay myself. And that's what's been happening recently. Like, I love all my bandmates. We're, we've been so cohesive. Um, it's been a sweet journey. And jumping back into the scene, the single release show at the Grape Room was our first show since March 6th of 2020, which was at Connie's Rick Rack. It was great. It was such a fun time. I love the Grape Room. Yeah, yeah. You used to, uh, used to, used to host the open mic there at, at one point, didn't you? Oh yeah, I started with Morgan Pinkstone. Do you know Morgan? Pinkstone? I know Morgan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met her through uh, the Sign Studios guys. So uh, Matt Teacher, Mike Lawson, uh, Katie Barbado was kind of part of that scene too. Uh, I recorded a couple records there, and I used to drop in and do session work there from time to time. Well, Morgan was the host before I was, and then I joined in maybe right around the same time that she has begun because Rick Sabatini was leaving and he was like, oh, can you host for me today? And I'm like, sure, Rick, you know, Rick was playing bass in my band. So Rick eventually just slid me into his role as open mic host. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't have to talk to the owner. Like, is this just how this works here? <laughs> and so I became the co-host with Morgan. We did every other week. Um, she eventually moved on to another job then I was just host by myself every week for about a year. And then they brought in three other hosts, Kevin McCall, Joshua Chase Miller, and Celia Tice. And we did a one week rotation. I know Kevin and, uh, and, and Josh. Uh, I don't know if I know Celia. Oh yeah. She's a wonderful songwriter and singer. And I think she just moved to Pittsburgh or somewhere. She, she moved away. But Kevin and Josh, yeah, like I've they've kind of been around uh, in in various things one way or the other for for quite some time. Oh yeah, Josh. Oh my goodness, he's his voice is like a carpet. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's so it's like full and like robust and like has that depth of tone. And then you, know, of course, I love Kevin and Andora. I love hanging out with those guys. They're some of my best friends in the industry. You you co-wrote with a guy named Danny Newport, right? Yeah, Danny Newport. I met him the first night at Grape Room. He was a bartender. So what what how did that relationship sort of blossom? Because I mean, obviously you guys met at Grape Room and then eventually you'd be writing songs together. Uh do you still write with him? Occasionally, not as much as then. We did our project, which took a good amount of time to finish. But Danny and I hit it off instantly. It was like, I thought he was joking at first because I've met so many hip hop artists who are like, yeah, you should come sing a hook on my song or do this and do that. And I'm like, okay, like I'll come sing a hook or I'll come check out what we got going on. And it's fun. But Danny was like, yeah, you should come sing with me. I'm a producer. And he really, really meant it. Like he's a great producer. He is always making new music always out there having a good time, meeting new people, staying a constant in the scene. 
And when we went into the studio together, the first song we wrote, it was like he had he had the same same keyboard that I had. So I'm on his keyboard and I'm playing a little melody line, like a chord, a nice, easy chord structure. And he comes up with these cool lyrics like you got away with words. You get away with everything. What does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so we we wrote that song together and then we were so excited about it that I think we just like we're living off the vibe of writing a fun song together for like months, just not doing anything but playing that song and just. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ended up writing a bunch of songs together, right? Yeah, we ended up writing a bunch that only four of them made it to the EP, but we probably wrote like eight songs together before we were finished writing in that time period. Um, the EP was the transition period EP. We wrote Way With Words, Riding and Rolling, uh, Transition Period, and UFO. And we had fun approaches with everything. When we wrote UFO, Danny had made that track that was all beep, 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 had all this like crazy sounds and he named the track Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, does he want me to write a song for Beyonce on this track? Like if it's like <laughs> for her eventually. So UFO started as a song concept in my mind as a song I'm writing for Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then, of course, once we got into the studio, it just changed into this whole other intergalactic mishmash. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> well, no, there there is a lot of, uh, and it's 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 one of the things that that strikes me uh, about about the music that you make is that it's. I mean, it's obviously rooted in soul and R and B because that's I think where your where your tastes were originally formed, probably particularly that like 80s and 90s era of 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 soul and R&B when it was just huge like n not just huge commercially but just like huge the sound was huge like i always think of uh like the sound on like Janet Jackson's albums and stuff like that mm -hmm. and how that like forever just changes what R&B is going to sound like but that's what the thing i like about your music is that like you obviously come from like a classic soul and R&B upbringing background it's in your blood it's it's just it's in your sound and then there's just all this weird shit happening and like that's where i dial in because i'm just like yes make it weird because i've been enjoying in the last like decade decade and a half of like hip-hop and r&b like getting to be weird you think of people like like d'angelo or kendrick oh, lamar yeah, yeah. Or, um or uh you think of some of that weird like kind of indie soul stuff like fka twigs and mm. uh and things like just really weird kind of <laughs> twisted Ocean. Yeah, you know, Frank Ocean too, definitely. Where like he's like, Well, what if we don't just have regular beats? He's like, What if the beats sound like like electronic music? Like what if they sound like Aphex Twin? If you have the choice between doing it normally, like throwing that pitch up the middle and giving people what they expect and doing it weird, like you should do it weird every single time. Like that's to to me, that's the interesting stuff. I blame Mario Paint. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, because they had the yeah, because that Mario Paint was a MIDI sequencer. Like really, yeah. when you get down to it, like they they tricked a generation of us into becoming like like being able to use MIDI. Yeah. Oh no, you're absolutely <laughs> right. I I never would have thought of that, but you're right. Yeah. Oh, I I used to do that all the time. Yeah, you make make them jump up, 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 and like yeah. and, then you, and then like the Yoshi would be like in the bottom, like blah blah blah, and you could just make these like bizarre. Oh, you're absolutely right. Mario Paint yeah. changed us all. They, they had like you you'd use like I remember trying to make beats with Yoshi and they were like beep pow, beep pow, beep pow, beep pow, beep pow, then like beep pow, beep pow, like all these weird noises going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah, because it's because you didn't have anything. Because you didn't have an MPC or a or or, or rolling eight oh eight. You just you had Mario Paint. <laughs> I'm so happy you know. Yes, you know. When you said Mario Paint, I was like, oh my god. It was, it was this whole other part of it that like wasn't even the the thing that you bought it for. <laughs> I'm sure if if we dive into like the internet we will find something somewhere where someone has created an app where we could actually mess around with that. Yes. That would be fun. <laughs> making beats, making beats in Mario paint. <laughs> well, that explains the weird a little bit, or at least like your, your, your tendency to move in directions that aren't standard uh, for, for genre. 
um, which is again always always commendable. Whenever someone's just like, "Yeah, I'm not going to do it the way that 800 other people have done it. I'm gonna again, I'm gonna do it weird." And it kind of just flows naturally. Like all those years of using weird sounds and just thinking of anything as an instrument naturally became a part of me. So now when I hear a sound, I'm like, oh, it needs something there. Like, you know, like it just needs some weird sound or it has to do something. And I'm not trying to make it weird. I just, that's what I think will sound good right there. Yeah. It yeah. interests you. The sounds like that are interesting to you. Yeah. And that's, so that's what you're going to put in there. It's, it's genuinely you. Yes, absolutely. One of the things that uh, uh, sort of like people who have talked about your music or talked about your performance when, when they talk about it is like you, you get terms like theatrical and drama that come up a lot. Are you down with that? Like is, is, do you, do you think that's, that's, that's like on, on the nose? Or do you think that's just sort of people's way of dealing with the fact that like, you know, you're putting on a very emotive show, you're putting on a very, you know, hype show. I think it's a bit of both because I don't feel like I would be as theatrical as somebody like Lynn manuel Miranda. Oh, yeah. Even though I find similarities in some of our songwriting, but mine is like coming from my personal life and his is for a production that's a play or movie. And so when I think about theatrical in my music, I think it's because it's sometimes telling a story or there are parts of it that are like it would be in a play. Like you could easily say, okay, I'm going to take that song and put it in a musical. It never had that intention. It was just, this is how I wrote a song. Um, the new album that we have, we're going to release it this year. There are some fun and beautiful storytelling songs on there. Um, one of which is my favorite. It's called Strong Love. And it just talks about a relationship and how the man is like, a broken down regular person who with dreams he meets the love of his life and they i won't say he or she they help them to become more of that beautiful person in the song they have kids and they grow up and it just becomes like this whole thing and i love having the ability to tell a story through a song i recently met someone on tiktok named tony and Tony, you know, on TikTok, you can do duets. So somebody can go in there and write a melody or a chord structure. And they say, duet this. And Tony did that. And he had a nice little piano chord structure. And when I listened to it, I ended up writing a song called 2125, which is what the, the chorus for it is. This is everyday life, 2125. Some worlds live and some die, 2125. And that's also a storytelling um, little number. And I met a woman on in the airport in LAX named Rory, who I played 2125 for. And she's like, that needs to be an anime short film. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. So these these songs just, you know, just tell a story and try to tell it the best I can. Um, I've heard of amazing storytellers like listening to people talk about, say, Biggie Smalls, probably one of the greatest storytellers in hip hop ever. I'm like, I want to be known as a storyteller. You know, in the back of my head, I want to tell some stories. It's not going to be like the super cool stories that Biggie Smalls might tell, <laughs> but <laughs> it might be just about, you know, walking down the street and kicking that rock three times before it finally went into the wrong direction or something like that. But it's true because like at, at its core, like all songwriting is storytelling in, in one way or the other, whether you're telling a narrative story or if you're like, you can tell narrative stories, you can tell character stories, you mm -hmm. can tell stories of just a particular moment, you can tell stories of a moment through like, you know, different viewpoints and all that. And that's the joy of taking it back to your English teacher who said that a song was not creative <laughs> writing. Um, <laughs> it's like, if anything, it's harder because you don't have that. You don't have the standard, you know, uh, style of prose where you can, you know, draw stuff out and describe things and all that. You got a song, you got anywhere from three to five minutes to get everything known, get in and get out. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and hope that everyone got the gist of it without you literally just saying, okay, once upon a time, although some songs do start that way. <laughs> what do you do 
in your life, like what, what are things that you see just in, in your life or things that you've gravitated towards uh, in live performance than then you've taken on and said, like, I want that to be part of, of what we do. I want that to be part of what an Arch Palatine show is. So I was a background singer for years in the Danny Ocean Band. Oh, no kidding. I was her background singer back in 2011 and 2012. And I learned a lot because I hadn't formed my own band at that point. I learned a lot working with her, um, learning how to run a band. And some of the things that she would do on stage, I was like, oh, I want to do that in my show. I haven't done it in a while, but she would go out into the audience and have her band play behind her and like kind of do a dance, right? And say, oh, can you do this dance? And then they would go, I could do that dance too. And then there would be like a back and forth of doing dances or like a call and response and just getting the audience participating. I love seeing that. I loved learning how to do that. That's one, like, and, and especially the call and response, like, hey, audience, you know, this is how the song goes. I hope y'all can sing it with me by the end. And then the crowd starts singing it with you. And everybody is like of one accord in the club at that moment. It's one of the greatest feelings I've ever had. I just love, and I got to say, I learned that from watching other bands play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like bringing the audience in and not just having it be the normal, the the normal is like, I'm on a stage and then you sit there, stand there and you watch this. And then when it's done, then we're done. Like you bring people into it. It's just like, this is a show. We're all part of this. And, this, and the great thing about live performance is like, it's never going to be like this ever again. So we might as well do whatever we want right now because- after tonight's over, then we'll play tomorrow, but that'll be a completely different thing, completely different audience, you know, all that. So that's, that's really cool. I've always liked that too. Uh, like bring, you, you got to bring the audience in and then they remember, they're just like, yeah, we had a yeah. good time. We sang with that band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, 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 it's that whole thing of just, yeah. Yeah. Like kind of break, breaking down that fourth wall, like just being like, we're all here. And especially for the kind of music that you do, which is, you know, it obviously there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of feeling in your music, but there's also just like a lot of party. It's just, it's, it's a party as well. Thank you. I imagine that's, that's what you're going for uh, as well. Sometimes uh, a friend of mine is like, always, whenever you write songs on piano, they always seem so rhythmic and I can't do that. He says, and I'm like, well, I don't know how to do what you do though. Like he's using all these an interesting chord structures and forms and inversions. And I'm like, I could do that, but then I had to sit there and think so hard. Yeah, well, I don't want to think. My... <laughs> <laughs> I just want to bang it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah it is. it's rhythm. Like that's what gets people. I mean, lyrics get people, melody gets people, but in the end, like if it's if the rhythm doesn't doesn't work for people, it doesn't work. And so, uh, but you seem very rhythmically oriented. Oh yeah, and we have a good time in rehearsal too. We're all, we've all been friends. I met Anthony in 2011 in an acapella group we were in together. And we just kind of became great friends then and stayed great friends and always were in each other's musical projects. And we're in rehearsal like, all right, it's a day of rehearsal or are we like getting drunk? Just hanging Anthony out. doesn't drink <laughs> or anything ever. He's never had any drink. He's the most blessed human being ever. I love it. But when I'm in there, I'll have a drink and like my former drummer who had to go because of a covid situation he and i used to get drunk and be in rehearsal till like four in the morning writing songs and just being ridiculous and we just want to have a good time i know a lot of times we also want to be serious we have our serious songs but i feel there's a pressure from the people in my life who are playing with music with me who are like oh can we not play any slow songs and i feel like i'm like giving them a lecture when I'm like, all right, let's play this slow song, this show. They're like, oh, okay, can I just go off stage on this song? Like, I mean, really? So <laughs> it's, it's all part of the show. It's, it's the ebb and flow of a live show though. You know, it's like you come in, you hit them with a couple of like, like the big, you know, big up numbers and then you bring it down a little bit and then you bring it back up again. Like that's the whole thing. It's like a little roller coaster ride. Exactly. Ah, Thank you. You get me. You get me. See? Thank you. It's 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 how it works. Like if it's all 
you know if it's all just like if it's all bangers like one like one after the other like that's cool but like you can't play for much longer than 25 or 30 minutes and then you just have to stop because <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's 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 like old yeah it's it's like old punk and hardcore bands where who could like blast off but they can only play for 25 minutes like mm. And it's great that 25 minutes is intense and then everybody needs a breather. <laughs> <laughs> Including yeah. me, who's like yeah. oh, screaming yeah. the whole show. Yeah, yeah. like like it, to, to that stuff, I'm always just like, all right, the, the, the drummer needs to go fall down now. So like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But you've, you've built a very cool band around you. So uh, it's it, it sounds like you've, you've got like the great musical support and you guys are all friends, which is always, I mean that's what you have to rely on sometimes, especially when you're not like getting the gigs you want or like during COVID when no one could do anything. It's, it's good to at least know these people are your friends and that, you know, you, you yeah. have this little circle around you of, of cool people. Oh yeah. We talk to each other every day, all the time. I'm always checking in. Like if I need to do anything or if I've missed any step or if they need to, you know, feel good. Like how you, how's your day going? Like we're like a support group for each other. We're becoming a family and, less and less becoming i mean less and less is arch palatine me being the ambassador and more of it being all of us together and that's what my dream has been it's just to find a group of guys who will ride or die and let's just make music and love it yeah yeah and you get on stage and then when it's great it's even greater because like everyone's in it together and then sometimes you're on stage and it's not great it's okay because you got each other like <laughs> and we know it's not great yeah and you can, but you can ride through you can all kind of like smile at each other and be like oh that didn't work um and then you just and then you just move on like yeah mm -hmm. it's it, that's the joy of having like having a group having an ensemble around you so you said you did the uh you did the single release party and that that went well like you you had the full band out for that had the full band out first show since covid as full band it went so well we started filming a music video while we were there we gave out a lot of cool merchandise we had sunglasses with spirals in them oh cool cool yeah and and everybody in the crowd at some point i asked them to put on their spirally glasses because our videographer was trying to get like a live edit of to splice with our music video of the people in the crowd and then we had a video shoot after that, where it's another scene from the music video that happens before the show. So it's all going to kind of come together as this fun thing. And it's been a good ride. I'm really proud of my guys and really feeling great about what's happening right now in the Philly music scene. I see so many people doing great things. The lineup and the bill for the show was so much more than I thought it would be. And I got to handpick all the bands that I uh, that were there. The first band is a collective who are running the open mic at the Ravens Lounge, um, led by a young artist named Cordell Anderson. And it's called Hood Folk. And Cordell is actually my cousin. And he's about, I don't know, 15 years, 10, 15 years younger than me. And when he was a little boy, one of the first shows I ever played, he was my guitarist and we played Grape Room. So it was kind of going full circle. Seeing full circle. Him, yeah. Yeah. Seeing him do his thing. He's they were amazing. They were. Oh, my goodness. They're just so talented. It was a saxophonist. I mean, named Ikechi. I don't remember the drummer's name, but he was absolutely fantastic. And then Cordell was playing the electric guitar and they didn't have any vocals or anything. They just jammed. And at some point me and some other friends were like doing the electric slide in the club <laughs> and just enjoying their music. The second band was Tony, who is the producer and songwriter that I met on TikTok from New York. They were on tour. They had just come from Nashville and then they stopped at Grape Room to do a set. Tony's set involved a full cellist and violinist. And then I was on the back, like trying to play the keys, but I really couldn't see my music too well on stage. I'm like, mm -hmm, yep, let me put my head down so you don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but his set was amazing. Following me is this band that's really been taking over Maniunk uh, called Baldini and the Bastards. And Anthony Baldini is a friend of pretty much everyone that I've met around town. And he was a close friend of mine for, he is, but we were really close for a while before COVID. And over COVID and everything, he went on a national tour, honing his musicianship. And now he has a stellar band 
and they play every all the time. It's so good. So I felt really proud about that, that whole night of music and just like, I want to do it again. I wanted to do it again, like the next day and just keep going. Well, are, are, are there plans? Uh, you, you got more shows re- ready to ready to roll out and things like that. Isn't that crazy? I We don't have any shows planned right now. We need some shows planned. Should get a residency at the Grape Room. You know, hey. you've, 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 you've still got clout there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> that would be dope. Yeah, maybe we can. I'll talk to Kevin. Residencies are great because you just bring in different openers. You could change it up every week. You can like you can have theme nights. It's like what a lot of people were doing with live streams, like, you know, during during the pandemic. It's like kind of th- making theming them and like almost like your own little residency, but you did it out of your house. Um, you guys should do that. That's fun. I like that stuff. And then it gives people an opportunity to see you. Like if they can't see you the one time they can come see you in two weeks or they can come see you in a week. Um, cause so often you, you know, it too, like you play a show and someone will come up to you the next day and just be like, Oh man, I wish, I wish I knew you're playing that show. And you're just like, well, I've only been talking about it for a month. So <laughs> yeah, but, but there, it doesn't matter how much you talk about it, how much you put on social media, posters, press or whatever. There's always someone who shows up the day after and says to you, Oh, I didn't know you played last night. You're just like. Well, clearly, <laughs> I need to do more. Clearly, money. you were never going to know that I played. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going to get out there. We're definitely going to get out there. There's like a tentative plan for a show at a festival over the summer. I hadn't really gotten all the details in, in May, in the beginning of May, right after Cinco de Mayo. Um, and there's some clubs that I am going to reach out to in the next day or two. But yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm totally stoked for it. It's it's an interesting time right now as everyone like over the last six months or so is like kind of trying to kick things back into gear, but also trying to do it in a way that makes sense. I just got the schedules of all my bandmates, so now I know when I can actually schedule some shows. <laughs> <laughs> How many guys are the band? It's like five or six other guys, right? Only four of us right now. Unfortunately, our fifth member got COVID really oh, bad. No. Oh, geez. And the linger, his name is JP John Palmer, and he produced yeah. a remix to Riding and Rolling, which was pretty fun. I got to reach out to him because I told him we would go through this cycle of shows without him this time, but then reach back out now. Ah, oh, that's, that's rough. Cause in the end, like you want nothing more than for people to just, I'm sure he too wants nothing more than just go play. Like that's, that's what you want. I mean, for certain, for certain ones of us out there, it's like, like I said, when you were a kid, it gets into you. And then as, as, as I joke all the time and people are probably tired of hearing the joke, but I was like, there's a certain point in your life where like you pick up a guitar, you sit at the piano or you sing and it's just like, it's over. Your life is over at that point. You're ne- you're never and, and like in in a great way. Like, but you're never gonna want things that regular people want ever again. Like you're mm-hmm. you're gonna like yes. set up your whole. You're gonna set up your whole life for the rest of your life wow. to chase that chase that particular dragon right wow. there. Like, wow, yeah. that is a really interesting perspective. I did it for years. I every every decision i made about where i lived how i lived the kind of jobs i would work uh when i would work was all based around being in a band and touring um and it's great but like it's also like it's really hard and there's a lot of sacrifice to it as well uh but yeah i mean i'm not telling you anything you don't know right there i'm agreeing with you 100 percent. but for you with this podcast thank you so much for having me on here oh absolutely absolutely i like to like i said people like Someone sent me your single at some point. Uh, I can't remember who. It might have been Kevin. It might have been Leah Meneker. Like, I, I can't oh, remember who sent yes, it to me. my homegirl. Or, like, someone talked it. And, like, it was one of those things where the period of one to two weeks, your name came up, like, seven times. And I was just like, okay. I'm like, I'm paying attention. Um, just in a collection of, like, people. Like, I think it was mostly Kevin and Leah. And, I, and then I saw, like, I saw a little bit of your presence on social media here and there. And I was like... Okay, this guy's real. Cool. I mean, not that people are real or not, not that people are real or not real, but like, you know, people say names all the time. Everyone's got a band now. Right, you know, right, right, everyone's right. a everyone's an insider. Like everyone's got the <laughs> everyone's got the scoop, you know? There is a part of me that always not holds back, but it's like, okay, I need to make sure that this is real. Like <laughs> that this isn't just someone who's just like, you know, because you see it all the time. It's like, I got a band, and then like six months later, what happened to your band? That ah, was too hard, so I don't have a band anymore. Mm. Um so, you know, you, you always want to make sure that when you're talking to people, they're not flashing the pan. But then I started listening to the music and I was like, oh, 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 this guy's real. Like, this is some real, this is some real thing happening right here. It's still surreal to me. It's still surreal to me. Like, you're like hearing this coming from you is like, all right, like I'm in my head. Like, this is real. Make sure you listen <laughs> to this. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I mean, it's just you've you've done the work. You put the group together. You wrote the songs. 
you guys practiced and, and and I know this sounds like like dumb things like of course every band does that but like not everybody does that or not everybody puts importance to that and you come from a world of you know technical training and all that so that you're just like well no if you want to be good you gotta you gotta work you gotta like work. you don't yeah I'm sure I you and I both know those yeah you and I know those musicians who can s- seemingly fall out of bed and just play yes and some of them do it from just just natural chutzpah like just natural talent like it just happens but the ones who are re- the ones who make it look easy if you like look in on them in their private time like they're sweating it out like they're they're sitting there with the instrument or sitting there at the piano just like figuring it out and it strikes me that's what you guys do like it looks great on stage it looks great it sounds great in the record and that is that is not an accident <laughs> oh man thank you yeah, we're burning the candle on both ends. Late nights, early mornings, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I feel guilty. I feel really guilty if I'm like, all right, tonight I'm not going to go out anywhere or do anything. And I'll sit in my house like, I'm supposed to be doing something. Well, sometimes you got to do nothing just for, for your brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Derek, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for talking. I look forward to when you guys uh, put the full length out. Uh, I think a lot of other people will be excited too for that. Well, thank you so much. And I listened to the episode where you played our song. I loved it. I was so excited. I'm like, yes, I'm going to do that interview. I wish you could hear me responding back to you. The- <laughs> <laughs> I try. I can't remember what I said. No, because that, that was the week. That was the week that, that, that like, for lack of a better term, no one would shut up about you. So I was just like, okay, okay, fine. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> not, not that I wasn't, not, not that I needed convincing or anything, but I was just like, you know how it is when you do a thing and then you also have a whole life that like, you know, you're, you're also yes. trying to keep on the rails and people are like, you know, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. I'm like, yeah, just give me, give me a second. <laughs> well, it's been awesome. I'm so happy to see a face to a name and a voice. Uh. Well, I look forward to seeing you out there in the world for, for real. And we will. And we will, my friend. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan. Well, that's the show for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Derek Anthony Wilson of the band Arch Palantine for talking, for chatting. Great, great talk. I always love talking about high school choir. I don't know why it is. Maybe I'm getting older, I'm getting more nostalgic, or I think back about uh, the the musical people in my life who kind of gave me a kick in the butt to get better. Anyway, great, great conversation with Derek Check out the music, archpalantine.com. New single out right now called Hypnotized. Another single coming out at the end of the month. The new record coming out later this year. Like I said, I've heard it. It's outstanding. If you like the singles that come out, you are going to love, love, love the record. Don't sleep on their show on 420, April 20th at World Cafe Live, along with Dead Friends and Philly Folk Review. That'll be a great time. Dawson Street Pub on June 17th as well. Go to archpalantine.com. Sign up for his mailing list. You can sign up for my mailing list at 25oclockpod.com. You can sign up for Arch Palantine's mailing list at archpalantine.com. I know that's a lot to run into a brain at one time, but I'm pretty sure we can do both. But if you do that at, uh, at Derek's website, he sends out emails, lets you know what's going on. And isn't that what we need? We need someone to periodically remind us in email form just what the heck is going on out there i think so so yeah archpalantine.com great great talking with derek am i gonna play it again yeah i'll play it again why not why not so back on episode 228 i played this track hypnotized by arch palantine it was my introduction to the band i'd never heard of derek never heard of the band before great great tune we're gonna hear it again it's from their forthcoming album hypnotized by arch palantine my name is dan drago This is 25 o'clock, Philadelphia's longest-running music podcast, I think. Until next time, be well, take care of each other, enjoy this track from Arch Palantine.
Like I'm tripping Oh baby, I'm tripping